The Dark Angel by Meredith Ann Pierce, Chapter 8, Quest and Flight. The journey was long and at the same time swift. The river veered first right, then left, and seemed to be descending in a strange irregular spiral through the rock on which the vampire's castle rested. It ran down, ever down, through an endless series of natural chambers. Some were huge and wide, filled with curtains and columns and pointed pedestals of crystal lime. Others were long and low, more tunnels than chambers. In one there was an opening in the wall through which she could see the stars. In their pale light and the brighter, warmer glow of the river, she saw that this was the haven of the bats. They flew in and out of the opening, and through the cave like silver moths, and many of them clung to the walls and ceilings like a mass of withered leaves. Their twittering, what she could hear of it, was high and wild and airy thin. Ariel laughed and was, not, and was surprised to hear how thick and deep her voice sounded next to theirs. Another chamber, hours later, farther down into the heart of the mountain, was latticed with silver combs, dripping honey like liquid amber. The great stingless bees that tended the combs were grayish gold, with bands of rose, and covered with velvet fur. She watched them crawling about their waxworks, building the six-sided chambers, filling them with sweet, thick honey, feeding their pale, formless young. On the far side of the room, in the greatest comb of all, Ariel beheld the queen, larger than the rest, surrounded by her nurses and clumsy drones. Then, much farther on, after Ariel had drilled into the, had drifted into, the, into sleep, she awoke to find herself in the greatest chamber she had yet seen. It was huge and dark. She could not see the limit before or behind. What she could see was the ceiling above, dotted with glowworms, whose pale yellow light burned like phosphor. The air itself was filled with fireflies that hovered in the dark, like candle flames. The stream ran nearly flat here, and Ariel realized it must have emerged from the mountain now, and be running under the plains. The cave of the glowworms ran on and on. She fell asleep again and dreamed she was riding through deep heaven, surrounded by the stars. When next she awoke, the first thing she thought was that she was still in the cave of the glowworms, but then she noticed that the lights overhead were smaller, silver, and, and Oceanus shone hoary blue in the middle heavens off to the right. There was a narrow bench on either side of her, then low, steep banks. The second thing she noticed was that her little craft was no longer moving. Its sail was full, and it still bounced and bobbed in the bright water of the stream, but it had run around on a little sandy, but it had run aground on a little sandy shoal. She got out of the boat to try and free it, but before she could do so, before she could do so much as lay a hand on it, it bounded away from her, merry as a greyhound. Then Ariel remembered that she must abandon the little boat anyway now that she had reached the plain. It was as well that it had abandoned her. She checked to see that the small velvet bag was still firmly tied to her belt, then walked across the beach and scrambled up the bank. At the top of the bank, she looked back at the stream for a last view of wind on the water, but she saw no sign of her, only a great heron winging low over the, over the river running. The bird shone very white, whiter than pure snow in the earth shine. It beat its wings, twice veered right, rose out of the gorge into the night-dark sky. Ariel watched it sail away over the plain toward Oceanus. The wind blew over Averick, bowing the grass and lifting Ariel's hair. She laughed. She had not realized how much the vampire's castle had oppressed her until now that she was free of it. Looking back, she saw it only as a tiny point on the far horizon. She said the rhyme, then once more. She said the rhyme, then once more, softly to herself. On Averick's white plain, where the Icarus now wings, to steeps of terrain, from tour of the kings, and damsels twice seven, his brides have become a far cry from heaven a long road from home. Then, strong hoof of the star horse must hallow him unguessed if adamant's edge is to plunder his breast. Then only may the war horse and warrior arise to rally the war horse host and thunder the skies. Then she turned her face toward Ocean Oceanus and set off across the plain. And I know this is a quick video, but we're going to Actually, no, we're going to keep going, and we'll pause in a little bit. Sorry for the interruption. The trip proved more arduous than she had imagined. She walked long hours through the high, gray-green grass, then sank down to rest, her legs trembling. She ate of the foods that the little in a little pouch. 
and slept on the bare ground, which was light and springy. The wind on the plains was warm, and she did not feel the want of a fire. Sometimes, far away, to the right or left, she saw small birds on wild ass or, or wild asses with bands of golden green streaking their flanks. Also she saw antelope, grass hens, and once two wild hunting dogs of mottled gray and tan. They watched her from a distance and yipped softly, but no more. Gradually, as the fortnight wore on, and all the walks and stops and sleeps blended into one, the stars shifted and Oceanus waxing to full, and then, waning again, rose a little higher in the sky. As she moved across the plain, the soil grew looser and drier. The grass stood shorter and sparser. Eventually the grass gave way to low scrub, and when at last the sun rose over the western mountains, Ariel found herself at the edge of the scrubland and the beginning of the dunes. She set off at once across the sand, which was white, with a pale orange cast to it. Though utterly dry, it had a faint cohesion, a sort of crust had formed on the surface of the sand. Though this was neither thick nor strong, Ariel found that if she stepped lightly and carefully, it would not break beneath her weight, but if she stepped hard or paused a moment in her, in her pace, the surface crumbled, and her feet sank ankle-deep in soft, coarse sand. She had not been traveling long after sunrise, nor had she gotten very far into the desert when she heard a shout far in the distance behind her. She paused, startled. It was almost a fortnight since she had heard a human voice. She half-turned, puzzled, expectant, almost elated at the thought of meeting someone, anyone, and then the soft crust crumbled beneath her feet. She saw him, the dark angel, coursing toward her, out of the north like a great hawk on the wings of utter black. She had no thought of hiding, for where could she hide, nor of facing him? If she were to save the race, she realized she must not let him take her, and the whole of his duros as yet, and the whole of the duros as yet untold plan now rested on her as well. She ran, light across the surface of the sand she ran. It held just long enough for her foot to leave its face before caving in, to leave a jagged row of footmarks in the dunes. Over one rise and then the next she fled, felt her hair streaming out behind her. She did not look behind. The dunes sped past. For a long time, it seemed, many heartbeats. Her breath was running short. Her pulse was racing. Her legs were growing tired. Then the, g then the gasp as she felt the wind of the dark angel's wings on her back and knew he was in the air above her and just behind. Turn around, he cried. His words were a deafening snarl. Turn around and face me. She did not listen. She did not answer. She ran on. He swooped. She fell to the sand and rolled. His wingtips brushed her cheek. Then he was gone, rising into the air for another pass. Ariel got to her feet and fled. The sand had broken when she had dived. There was sand stuck in her. There was sand in her hair now, in her eyes, in her ears. She batted it from her lips, sucked in her breath, and ran on. The vampire swooped again, not deep enough. She ducked and dodged and continued running. The Icarus gave a scream of rage and pulled up for another try. His scream was answered. From across the dunes sounded a roar, rolling, thundering. Ariel spun around behind her. On the crest of a dune she saw a great beast, a lion with a mane of gold. His body was white golden. He shone like the sun. The Icarus screamed again in his rage, and the lion challenged him with a roar that shook the air. For a moment she thought they would battle. The dark angel hovered in the black sky just above him. The bright lion crouched, ready to spring. Then suddenly the Icarus turned and rushed headlong through the air toward Ariel. The great lion sprang in pursuit. Ariel started like a deer and fled. They were both behind her and very close. She could hear the lion's paws touching the sand, the vampire's wings beating the still air. They were closing on her rapidly. Presently she caught sound of their breathing, the dark angels harsh and hoarse, the lion smooth and deep. She realized they would reach her at almost the same instant and had just decided she would surely be torn apart between them when the vampire caught her. First by the hair, then by the arm, he hoisted her aloft, his hand was so cold it burned. She looked into his eyes, and they were colorless, egg-white, ferocious, full of madness. He bit her throat, 
near the shoulder, and Ariel screamed. The lion sprang. His collision with the Dark Angel jolted her, staggered the vampire in midair. The Icarus shrieked and let go, go of her as the great cat raked his face. Pressed between the two of them, she could not fall. Her right side froze and trembled against the Dark Angel's bloodless flesh, while her left side burned and writhed in the heat of the lion's body. With his other paw, the great cat dragged four long gashes down the vampire's shoulder. The Icarus twisted away. The lion dropped to earth. Ariel fell and lay stunned on the sand, looking above her at the deep, bloodless wounds in the Dark Angel's face and shoulder. Before the vampire could recover himself, the lion had sprung between him and Ariel. The pale, golden cat's huge head bent over her. She shut her eyes and prepared to die, his mouth closing gently, firmly over her arm. Pulling her up, he half shrugged, half slung her over his shoulder, then bounced off in, a, in great strides across the dunes. Ariel lay dazed, her throat where the Icarus had bitten her, was an agony of fire and ice. She felt so winded, she could hardly breathe. She felt her arm held hard in the lion's mouth, his great pointed teeth pressed into her flesh, but they did not so much as break the skin. She felt the rush of wind along her body, and the movement of the lion's lithe, hard muscles beneath the skin as he ran. His coat was soft and warm as sunlight, and she sensed that beneath his flesh was hotter still. He smelt like heated oil and sandalwood. She saw the Icarus in the sky behind them. He made no attempt to follow, but hovered in the air, watching them, screaming his fury. The rhythm of his churning raven wings seemed altered somehow, rougher, oddly strained, she could not fathom it. He grew farther away with each bound of the lion. At last she saw him turn and start a slow limping flight back southward toward the castle. Then Ariel realized she was bleeding from the throat. Blood streamed from the wound the vampire had made. She felt cold. She shivered. The wind was cooling and drying the blood on her kirtle. It made the pale, soaked garment cling to her side. She stared at it, appalled. Presently... She were very light-headed, and in a little time more, felt herself slipping into a swoon. And that is where we will pause for now.